Good morning. And welcome to Spindale United Methodist Church. I have a few announcements to share. There will be a trustee meeting following today's service. If you are a member of the committee, please plan to stay. There will be a finance team meeting next Sunday following the worship service. Come join our volunteers as we host a drive through meal on Wednesday, September 18th at 5 p.m. We'll, we will be serving pinto, slaw, and cornbread. Contact Bill McDaniel if you would like to help. Saturday night alive. Mark your calendar to come join us for a night of fun with food and games and on Saturday, September 21st at 6.30 p.m. Please bring your favorite games, start writing the word, and invite a friend. For our ministry of the month, we are collecting items for the Path Shelter. See your monthly newsletter or weekly e-news for a full list of items needed. Please join me in prayer. Give us, O Lord, steadfast hearts, which no one worthy thought can drag downward, unconquered hearts, which no tribulation can wear out, upright hearts, with no unworthy purpose may tempt aside. Bestow upon us also, O Lord, understanding to know you, diligent to seek you, wisdom to find you, and faithfulness that may finally embrace you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen.
video because that's the second time I've tried to show it and it hadn't worked so there's something uh, stopping us from doing that we'll get that another date we'll try it again but uh, if you know who Tim Hawkins is I encourage you to watch the video the worst um, that's the title of what he's talking about there and it's hilarious it's definitely on point today surprisingly enough we're not talking about jukebox hero again today we did that for like 20 weeks we had fun with it, I think we did, and, and I still have some songs left over. We'll do the next round uh, next year when we get back to that. But today we're starting one that I'm really excited about, too. This will be challenging. Your toes might hurt a little bit, as mine do and, and when, I, when I wrote this, but it's called Blabbermouth. That's the name of the series, Blabbermouth. And we're going to be talking about some topics, and Doug said amen, so he knows something firsthand about this topic blabbermouth. Uh, we're going to talk about lying, criticizing, gossiping, and today if the video would have worked you would understand what we're talking about today which is complaining. Any complainers here in the crowd? Thank you for your honesty. If you didn't raise your hand it yeah 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 yeah, yeah, lying, yeah lying we'll get to that one in a couple of weeks but it's kind of like this I mean I think all of us in some respect complain all of us have complaints about this or that. Has anyone ever heard of the, uh, the ministry called Walk to Emmaus? You ever heard of that? It's a great ministry. Great ministry. But I didn't know that. And you get invited to it. And I'm a talker. I don't know if you've noticed that about me. If you ever met me, you know that I'm probably going to say a lot. And then you just have to walk away from me after a while because I won't stop. I keep pulling my strings. But anyway, we went to this thing called Walk to Emmaus, and a friend of mine who sponsored me to go, this was before I was in ministry, but I was back in church, he invites me, and on the first night, I'm not supposed to tell you details of the weekend, and I'm not going to, but it kind of, you know, vaguely, we'll talk about the first night. We get there, but first of all, you have to take off your watch. There are no phones, no watches, no concept of anything else other than the place you're at that weekend. But then they march you into this, this room and they show this very antiquated film, that black and white. I mean, it's, I think God starred in it. Actually, God was in it. It's, it's that old as before man was even created, God was in it. So I'm watching this going, okay, well, this is, it's going to get better because I'm an optimist. It's going to get better. But then they told me the words that I never wanted to hear that just really hit me to my core. They said, you have to remain silent from this point going forward. You have to remain silent, okay? And so I'm going back to my room and I'm doing everything but being silent. I'm going, I'm turning, turning into Yosemite Sam, shmackin' frackin' 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 I can't do all that. And I got back to my room and my bunk mate was, you know, up, up there and we were talking, like 12 of us in a room. And I, I'm complaining really about the fact that I can't talk. Now that I'm uncomfortable, that this makes me feel very uncomfortable. And he said, well, maybe, sir, a fellow that I don't really know that well, maybe this is less about you being comfortable and more about you growing in your faith. And then I, was, I found it very easy to be quiet after that. <laughs> I did. Complaining, complaining, complaining. I will say this, that was a major, major catalyst for me going in ministry that weekend and we didn't have to stay quiet the entire time it was just that night they gave us the freedom to speak again the next day but anyway that's not a promotion for walk to Emmaus but it is a promotion for how sometimes when we complain we miss a blessing right now when I think about the complaining in the Bible the first first place my mind goes to is to the story of the Israelites otherwise known as God's chosen people who even after God did miracle after miracle after miracle and freed them from the slavery that they had been in forever, what do they do? They complain and they griped and they whined. And then, yeah, instead of leaning into the uncomfortable setting and growing, they just did what? They complained some more. They complained some more. In fact, this is what they said to Moses in Exodus, and this is just so sad to me, but we do this. It's sad to me because this is kind of the human condition. It says this, they said to Moses, what, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us out to the desert to die? Oh my gosh, really? 
what have you done to us? And just say the, the, the whiniest voice you've ever heard. What have you done to us by bringing us out to Egypt? Did, didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone? Listen to this. Didn't you, didn't you leave us alone? Let us serve the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. Can you catch that? The complaint in that? I mean, does that sound familiar to maybe someone you know? To maybe yourself? Right? It sounds very familiar, doesn't it? Well, yeah. And I say that because in many ways, we as a society have this PhD in the ancient practices of winery and complaint sometimes. It's too hot. It's too cold. It's too light. It's too dark. I'm hungry. I don't like this place. I don't like these people. This is uncomfortable. And so after hearing all this complaining and such from the chosen ones, quote unquote, right? That's when Moses kind of drops his theological bomb amongst the Israelites and turns it around and says this in Exodus chapter 16, verse 8. He says, when you grumble, you're not grumbling against us, but you're grumbling against the Lord. You're grumbling against the Lord, right? Now, with that said, I want you to imagine if that every time, that, and, and just work with me here. I asked you to close your eyes a few weeks ago. You don't have to do that now, but I want you to suspend disbelief for just a moment and put yourself in this position. And I want you to imagine that if every time that we complain, that it's not just about our circumstances. It's not just about the traffic. It's not just about the other person. But what if in God's eyes, every time we complain, we're complaining about God? What if that were the case? Well, it kind of is the case. It's what it says right here, isn't it? It kind of is the case. Every time we complain, we're actually striking out against God. And so since most of us understand that, yeah, we complain sometimes, what I want to do today is to try to personalize this and embarrass you. Is that okay? Yeah, no, I'm not going to do that, but I'm glad you're willing to let me embarrass you. That was a great step of faith right there. What I want to do is I want to use this or kind of craft this sermon in the, through a lens of our own complaining. I want you to think about your own lives as we're talking about this today. Therefore, in an honest moment, what I want to ask you is this. What is it, and don't shout it out because I don't have time for all that this morning, okay? I really don't. I just don't have time. I don't have time, okay? What I want to ask you is, what is it that you complain about the most? Maybe you write it down. Maybe you memorize it. Maybe you write it on your spouse's or significant other's arm, whatever. What is it that you complain about the most? What is it that ruffles your feathers and makes you whine and gripe? Well, for me, honestly, and you've heard this many times, but for me, it starts at Walmart. Walmart always drives me crazy because every time I, I go in there and I grab that cart that's like this and going all over the place and these people come out of the woodworks and just try to antagonize me, I lose a little more faith in humanity. I do about every time. Another thing that's, that, that kind of gets me too is when I go and pay good money at a place and they treat me rudely. Like the person through the drive through you've heard those stories too. It drives me insane. I'm up here purging about this because I'm like, just go, I might go crazy if I don't. It's like this. A few weeks back, Sabra was in the hospital. Thank you for your prayer. She's doing great now. But it was like the morning, the, the next day she was there, I went out to a, a local restaurant. I won't tell you what it is. We, we've got a picture, but maybe this is not the actual picture, but <laughs> don't worry about it. Maybe we know. That's a picture of me. There you go. There's a drive through Maybe it tells what it is on there, but they look so happy, don't they? The exchange, I give you some cash, you give me some grub, I drive away, and the birds are singing, and everything's good, and all that stuff, but that's not how it really goes down, is it? You go up there and you have a person who doesn't like you. you. You feel like it because they look at you like you're like that tall, whatever. They don't, they don't want you to be there. They don't want to be there themselves. So I went through that morning at this establishment and I ordered my food. And it was a certain price on the menu, okay? And this certain company always said that you could upsize for, you get any size drink for a dollar. Maybe I just gave away who it is right there. And so I thought, with that being said, you can get any size drink 
for a dollar because I went to school. I have diplomas on my wall. I know what math looks like. We say any size. So I'll go up and I order my breakfast, I upsize the, the sweet tea. I get around there. It's like $3 more. It's eleven twenty-three for a little sandwich and a half a hash brown that was burned and a drink that was like spilling out the top. The lid wasn't on well. And the person didn't look at me. Uh, and, and I won't describe how this person looked, but it's not professional at all. And then said, 1123, and I said, have you lost your mind? <laughs> I did, I did. I lost my, my faith in my, my religion. I'm glad they didn't ask me what I did for a living. But I was like, no, you, have you lost your mind? And she's like, well, just, how did you get 1123 as a total? Because it's like seven bucks, which is overpriced. Anyway, but it was seven bucks. It turned into 11. I said, how did you get there? And she said, tax. And you know what I did? I did the most Christian thing I could do in that moment. I just drove away. <laughs> I didn't even say another word. I, I just drove away, left the breakfast like right in her hand, and I went away. Anyway, that's, that's me. I feel so much. Thank you all for this caring and listening to me this morning. So maybe, maybe for you, it is the price of food. I mean, that's, that's, that's a tough thing right now. Or maybe it is that teenager in the drive through who is disrespectful or rude or whatever. Or maybe it's that the weather is bad or that the Wi-Fi is slow. I've complained about that too. Or Lord forbid that the pastor's sermons are too long. No one would ever say that here. But even so, and please understand that I'm not trying to minimize any of your complaints because sometimes the complaints are warranted. I get that. But at the same time, at the same time, please hear this. What I hope you understand is that the problem is really not the weather. And the problem is really not the Wi-Fi. And it's not the rude teenager at the drive through And it's not, you know, hopefully it's not the pastor, okay? But rather the problem is that for so many people, including me, sometimes we end up taking our eyes off of the goodness of God and placing them directly on whom? ourselves. It's all about me. I don't like this. This makes me feel uncomfortable. And I'll tell you why that gives God very little wiggle room to grow you and to grow me. It's kind of like this. Um, you know, and I see this all the time on social media and I complain about it so much, ironically enough, but but I, I still say on social media, I don't know why I, I go back to it. I guess it's so entertaining, but there's someone I know, and I won't give names, obviously, in this, but, but she went through a, uh, apparently a bad marriage, and, and that's, that's so unfortunate, and I get that, and, and there's ways to you know, heal, and there's counseling, there's things you can go through to kind of get through those steps. Uh, the, the way she tries to get through the marriage is she blasts every little detail on social media. Okay, and I get that. Maybe that's part of the catharsis. Maybe that's in her mind doing that. The problem is, uh, and I could just clump this into a, many people I've seen do this, but I'm just kind of thinking about, about this one right now. The problem with this scenario is the complaint is there. The ex-husband's a narcissist. He's this, he's that, or whatever. All while her present husband is right there reading this about how she's not over that part of her life there's no healing and also how a church reads that and saying wow you know maybe your faith is not really that helpful at all you know it's perspective in this and it comes out as a complaint and it makes other people very suspicious as to you know who kind of steers your life and what's going there and again i'm not minimizing anyone's pain we've all had pain we've all gone through things and all that it probably number one is not a great idea to blast it on facebook right it, just, it, it probably isn't what do i say usually post a picture of a puppy or a, a grandbaby like our grandbaby's here this weekend so I, i'll probably post a bunch of pictures here very very shortly uh, or you know the wonderful yard sale you know those those kind, all the wonderful things in life you probably don't want to put it out there you especially don't want to do that when you have someone who's next to you, who loves you unconditionally, and it almost sounds like you're not over what you were into before. I hope you understand what I'm saying there. You see, with that said, what, what I want to do today is I want to look at a very powerful text written by the Apostle Paul 
because who if there's anyone and i don't have time to list all the things he went through a ton of them ask doug after the service he'll be glad to spend 10 minutes with you and explain everything paul went through but he went through a ton and at the end uh, uh, end of his life really you know even though he had the right to complain we find that he didn't but paul was at the end a prisoner in rome and he's chained to a guard 24 7 they would work rounds of eight hours a piece or whatever and he was stuck there and in his mind what paul wanted to do more than anything else is do what he wanted to preach in rome he wanted to talk to the leaders he wanted to talk to the people there expose jesus christ how jesus had changed his life but instead of getting that he's chained to a stinky old roman guard all the time so you would think yeah yeah He's going to complain. But as it played out, instead of becoming the evangelist to the Romans, you know, Paul ends up again staying here for two years, chained to a Roman guard. And so, yeah, you would think complaining and whining and telling God why God was wrong. We love to do that, don't we? God, if I was God, I wouldn't have done this. God, if I was God, I'd change these situations. I certainly hope when we meet God that that's probably not as much of a question we're going to ask him as just accepting that we're in his presence. I hope that. I mean, I have a lot of questions for God now, but I think when I get in his, what does the song say? I, I'm going to fall to my knees and just thank God that I'm here. I hope that's where, but right now, I understand we have questions, but that's not where Paul took this. Matter of fact, this is what Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. He said, do everything without what? grumbling or arguing one translation says complaining so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped in a warped and crooked generation that translates very well to modern times doesn't it? a warped and crooked generation now in truth I admittedly so that's a very high standard and and there's a lot of very spiritual reasons as to why we should live without complaining but there are also some practical ones let me just kind of roll that out here quickly um, uh, in, in a book called emotional intelligence 2.0 I don't know if you've read that it's a great book it's by dr. Travis Bradbury and on in his research what he discovered was that and I've said this before but when we repeat these patterns like repeat complaining and this uh, the specifics of this talk it actually hardwires our brains to do what more complaining the more you complain the more you're going to complain in other words the more negative we are the more likely our brain is going to be triggered to become what more negative in fact he went on to say that when we have this kind of negative mindset that before long we may even enter into what is called negative confirmation bias which is where a person expects something bad to happen even before it does happen, right? For example, it might be where someone has this preconceived idea that all men are losers and jerks. Anyone think that? Anyone? You guys okay? Is this, is this hurting you too much this morning? That's okay. I like that. I like the uncomfortable awkwardness. I like that. But some people may think that all men are losers and jerks. And so when you see a man walk in a room, what's going, what are you going to think? Loser. L on the forehead. Jerk. Right? You're, you have these preconceived ideas as to who they're going to be. In fact, going back to our story in Exodus, this was the problem with the, the Israelites. I mean, in short, as it played out, they were negative when they were in captivity, and that's understandable. They were slaves, so they were negative then. But then when they were freed, guess what they were? They were still negative, maybe more negative. We don't like negative, do we, people? Do we like negative? Anybody? Do we like negative? No, no one likes negative, the negative person who's always there, the Debbie Downer, if you will. And you see, the reason that it proved to be true that they were so negative no, no matter what their situation was is because their negative mindsets trained them to see the negative before they saw the positive. And, you know, I don't know about you, but for me, I don't want to just go through life with, you know, preconceived to find the bad first. And I say that because there's plenty of bad in this world right now without me or anyone adding to it, right? And so as Paul explains, as people of faith, it is so important for us to escape this negative mindset by retraining 
renewing our minds to find the things in the life through God that are good, pleasant, helpful, and hopeful. In fact, when you look at the way Paul lived and what he taught, he would essentially com communicate two big ideas. And the first one's this. And again, I, I never promise this is going to be easy today. You guys doing okay? Yeah, good, good, okay, all right. Awesome, it'll get harder as we go here. Just want to set you, make sure you're okay. I'm kidding, it's not that hard. First one is this. First big idea is if you can change your circumstances, guess what? Change your circumstances. Hey, wow, I could just drop the mic and run off the, run off the platform here, right? If you can change it, change it. In other words, in your life, if there's something that is negative, unpleasant, or just not right, but there is something that you can do about it, well, then do something about it. Don't just complain about it. In other words, even as a person of faith, we shouldn't go through life and pretend like everything's okay when everything's not okay. Does that make sense? We shouldn't pretend when it's, it's not good. And you see, I say that because it's not a sin. It's not a sin. One more time. It's not a sin to notice that something is not right, but it is a sin to just complain about something you can fix, but then don't fix it. That makes sense? That's, that's the, the difference in that. And so if there's something that you dislike or something that gives you righteous heartburn or something that isn't right in the eyes of God, well, don't just sit there and complain about it. Don't go to the drive through window and say, I'm going to drive away. Don't do that. Do something to fix it, right? Do something. Don't complain about it. Don't post it on social media to stay off of that. But rather, if it's, if in your own power, get out there and change it, and make it better. Do something about it. Okay, so first, if you can change your circumstances, do something about it. And then a second thing Paul teaches us is this, and this might be much harder, but if you, can, if you can't change your circumstances, then do what? Change your perspective. Change your perspective on it. In fact, this is what Paul said in Philippians chapter 2, verses 17 through 18. And, and keep in mind, this is when he was chained to a Roman guard writing this kind of stuff. He said this, he said, But even if I'm poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. Now, for a lot of people, they think that when Paul was talking about being poured out as a drink offering, he was talking about being martyred about his death, but that's only kind of partially uh, to the point here, because in Paul's perspective, um, what he did, how he acted, what he said, and how he represented God on a daily basis, that's where the sacrifice was, right? You ever think about that? When you get out into the world and you go into the Walmarts or the drive throughs of the world, how you act, how people see you, what you post on Facebook, do you think that affects people? They know who you are. If you're a person uh, of faith, especially in a small community like this, we know everything what, that everyone's doing, don't we? And that's good in some ways, if it's a good thing you're doing. But if you're doing something else, like me driving, in the, you know, I have to remind myself, I'm a pastor, yet I'm still going to drive away when I hear 1123 for a sandwich. I'm still going to do that, Right? Can I change that? No, I can't change the fact they charge too much for this little bit of mess that I like to eat for some reason. I can't change that, but I can change my perspective. My perspective might say I'll go somewhere else. My pers perspective might say I'll make a sandwich before I leave. My perspective might say, you know what, I'm paying entirely too much, but you're a good person behind there. Keep, you, you keep doing that job. You'd be happy. I'd never say that one, <laughs> ever. But it is a possibility for you. Maybe you can do that. I don't know. I, I can't do that. So Paul is saying we represent God daily. That is the sacrifice. In fact, this is why Paul said what Paul said in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. He says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Did you catch that? true and proper. You are worshiping God in the way we act amongst his people. 
right, and even privately, too, the same way. We are representing worshiping God in that way or not worshiping God. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's good will actually is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. You see, worship isn't just when we come up here and, and raise our hands or, you know, we're really, we're smiling or crying, we're emotional in the moment. Worship isn't just tithing. Worship isn't just coming to church every time the doors are open, open. But rather, worship is offering your life to God every single day, okay, wherever you are, even if you're stuck in traffic, even if you're trying to navigate your way through the crazies in Walmart. Even if you are chained to a Roman guard. See, the reason that Paul could still praise God, even though he was in chains, was because for him, Paul was not the center of his own story. Jesus was the center of Paul's story. You see the difference in that? It's so hard for us to extract ourselves from the middle that this is all about me. It's about my preferences. I can't believe they said that. I can't believe they did that. All these things. I can't believe they charged that. That is putting ourselves in the middle of a narrative that was written for God right there. We have to understand the difference there. And so because Jesus was the center of Paul's story, Paul could then take a negative circumstance and then change his perspective about it in such a way that it would impact, that it would allow God to do some wonderful things through his life. You know, what can God do through a sour person who complains all the time? Very little. Very little, because no one's listening to that noise. No one's attracted to that kind of chin music. They're really not. You know, you might hear it and you, as a spectator and get entertained by it, but you're not going to be moved. You're certainly not going to be moved to take a step towards Jesus, right? And God certainly has very little wiggle room to use you or use me when we're sour, when we're the opposite of that. In fact, that is why Paul, who was, was without argument in a tight spot in this situation, you know, this is why he could say this with a straight face in Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 and 3. He said, now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me, and how can he write this? And this is insane to me, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel, right? As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for who? For Paul, for the drive through lady, for the crazies at Walmart. No, for Christ. You see, just as we glean from Paul's words in this passage, the truth is that Paul is not complaining, but rather he's just changed his perspective. And because he did that very thing, he can only see the power in the goodness of God in all things. Now, have we arrived there? No. You just talk to me for five minutes, and you'll say, oh, my God, I don't even think Eric gets it. Because that is our natural progression of thought, to complain. I didn't like that, right? That's the voice, God. Right? That's my real voice. Right? I'm a whiner. I'm a whiner. Why would you like me to preach in that voice every Sunday morning and complain about every single thing that happened, right? I don't even do impressions. That was just me. I mean, that's just me. Inside, that's my voice. Me, me, me. Right? Sometimes you had no idea. And my wife would go, just look at me. Yeah, that's not it. That's not it. What if, what if we were to look for the power in the goodness of God in everything, every single day, even when that person cuts you off in traffic, even when that, that wheel on the car flips over and goes, uh, goes crazy, even, you know, whatever situation you may find you're in. What if you were reminded that I'm blessed with this stuff? so much more than I can complain about. What if life looked like that? Wouldn't it be crazy? In other words, Paul could have very well said, this isn't my plan. God, this is not what I planned for my life. This isn't what I, could, I would have chosen. There are a lot of reasons why I could probably complain about this, but because I can't change my circumstances, the one thing I can change is my perspective about my circumstances. Why? Well, because for Paul, he knew that God works in all things, all things, all things to bring about good according to his purpose for those who love him. Now, I am winding down. Whew. Got a lot of energy today. Got a lot of energy. 
I don't know who this is going to speak to. Maybe you have tuned out, you know, five or ten minutes ago, and that's maybe that, that's whatever. You feel like you're, you know, you don't, you're above the fray maybe. Your, your halos just need a little polishing. You're good, all right? But for the rest of us human, mere mortals here, I, I don't know who this is going to speak to here or on Facebook Live, but if you're in a place that you don't like right now, I hope you recognize that God still has a plan for you and God still has a purpose for you. I mean, it may not be what you have chosen. I get that, totally get that. And it may not be what you want, but even so, that doesn't mean that God can't use it or use you specifically for his greater good. And so, and we are closing now. With that said, here's my question. And I've said something similar to this before, but I think it's worth repeating in whatever form I put it here. But just as Paul was chained to a Roman soldier, I want you to be real honest with yourselves this morning. What is it that you're chained to? What is it in your life that you're dragging around behind you that's just weighing you down like you'll never be happy? Oh, Lord, how mercy. Uh, playing the world's smallest violin. Na, 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 na. What is it in your life, and I'm being melodramatic, obviously, or dramatic, obviously, what is it that you're chained to that is bringing you down in your life? And ladies, I hope you don't say your husband. That, that would be rude. Don't start there. No, it's easy in the front row. Don't start there. Let's not be sarcastic about this. But maybe it is a very painful relationship that you were in, and you're carrying the residuals with you. And again, not minimizing that. I totally, absolutely get that. But there are methods that you can, you can um, you know, lean into that will help. Maybe, maybe it's a loss. Maybe it was an abusive relationship that you were in before. Maybe it's a job or a school situation where you don't know what you're going to do. Maybe it's a financial problem or a health crisis that you're, that you're chained to, right? Any of those things. But whatever it is, remember that instead of complaining about it, even though you have every single right to complain about it, I get that, but if you can do something about it, folks, listen to me. Do something about it. Pray about it. Get counseling. Seek help. Turn over a new leaf etc. Turn it around for the glory of God, because I promise you, we're going to be there a lot longer than we're going to be here, right? That's eternity. This is just now. This is prepping us for eternity, right? And then, if you can't change your circumstances, and many times we can't, and then, well, change your perspective. Change the way you look at what you're going through, and I could give many examples of people who do this all the time that I'm looking at going, oh my gosh, I would just crack under pressure. I wouldn't be able to do it. I'd be miserable. I'd be the opposite of, you know, what Paul is saying here. I get that. So some people just move me to want to be a better person. Really, really do, right? So if you can't change it, change your perspective. Or in other words, change the way you look at it, change the way you think about it, change the words that you speak about it. Moreover, rather than complaining about something you cannot change, choose to see God's presence, His providence, His power, His goodness, even in the middle of a situation that you would have never, ever asked for in your life. Whew, you did it. I'm proud of you. We're done. Let's pray. Most Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your, your grace and your love. Thank you for showing us the correct path, the path that will lead to a, a life that, of, of power and purpose in your name, a life that can, can, can do good for others. You know, people are watching us, as we, even as we say we are people of faith, I think that makes people watch us e even more because they want to see us trip up sometimes. I mean, it's like watching a wreck. You know, if everyone gets out on the front lawns and watches, watches what happens when the ambulance goes by, those kind of things. I think the same thing happens with people of faith. When we're out in the world and we're complaining and griping and whining and doing those kind of stuff, you know, that's not very attractive. That's not honey to the bee. No one's coming to join that circus, okay? But when we're out there and we're a little bit different and we say, that's not really going to bother me. As a matter of fact, I can do something about that and I'm going to. Or I can't do anything about that. But you know what? My perspective is on God and his power and his goodness and his providence. I'm going to lean on that. That's what I'm going to do going forward. 
And I promise you, this life, though it seems like it's forever sometimes, it's not. It's going to end one day. We all, none of us make it out of here alive. And I pray that we understand the, the beauty and the gift that life is and that we just kind of wake up each morning and do the best we can not to complain, not to forget the blessing that we already have in our life now. For us in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I love how you always answer. She's awesome. <laughs> Thanks, Doug. <laughs> so uh, just want to remind you of a couple upcoming things. First, Saturday Night Alive. Come on Saturday night. It's going to be a great time. Bring friends. Uh, we've been advertising to the community, trying to get uh, as many people there as possible. And you know what they say. If you don't come, we're going to talk about you. Okay? <laughs> Yeah. Mm, that's there, a good question. There'll be food there, right, Eric? I didn't hear the question. Sorry. Will there be food? At there will be food, yes. Yes. I, 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 I think it's the time you came in the kitchen. <laughs> And uh, definitely, it'll be a good time. Um, in addition, book study is starting back up on October, was it 10th, I think? And um, we've chosen a book. It's going to be, If God is Love, Don't Be a Jerk. So um, feel free to check out that book and come join us starting on October 10th. Uh, please uh, stand, all who are able, and join us in singing 10,000 Reasons. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy It's a new day dawning, it's time to sing your song again, whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the
Let's hear it. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. You can be seated. You're already on your way. Good. Uh, <laughs> I got you. I got you. Um, just real quickly on um, Mara, would you like to speak to the yard sale yesterday or no? Okay. Yeah, it was great. Thanks for uh, all I've heard is that so many people showed up. There are a lot of volunteers. I know during the week and yesterday uh, there was a substantial amount of gain from that uh, to help local ministry. So thank you for that. Wait, Susan, time up. Yeah, okay. 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 <laughs> Oh, yesterday. Okay. Friday. Friday. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Who was that? Do we know? It doesn't matter. But uh, doesn't matter. But but anyway, that was very that was very nice. They did that uh, as well. So we do have food in the pantry for blessing box and other other things. But thank you for the yard sale help. It went very well, and that'll be um, a great asset for some, some community ministries there. Uh, there was something else. Yeah, Frankful Fridays. Thank you for everyone to help with that. Oh yeah, the big one. This coming Saturday, again, Lauren talked about it this morning, and PJ just talked about it. Uh, Saturday, 6.30, 8 o'clock, we're having Saturday Night Alive. I told you last week it wasn't about you, but I do want you to come. I mean, I do. I mean, I do want you to come. We need you to come, but we need you to bring someone who doesn't come to this church typically. Okay, that's the idea. The idea is to grow. The idea is to you know, step into a different territory that's not so churchy. You know, not that this is too churchy. Don't anyone over me? Just say it was. I didn't say that. I didn't say that. But it may be comfortable for someone who doesn't go to church. That might be more comfortable there. So that's what Saturday Night Alive is. There'll be music. I understand there's a wonderful actor here from a native of Smendale who said that he may just do his impression of Andy Griffith. Uh, I'm not gonna be able to do it. He's not gonna be able to do it. Okay, so there you go. He's not gonna be able to do it. But I think that'll be coming up at some point in time, hopefully, we'll get that. But we will have music, we will have pizza, we will have games. I will throw out something very profound, just like a sentence, okay, and we'll talk about it. It may not be that profound. Nancy, what makes laughing at me? I, I get it. I get it. Uh, but it'll be a lot, a lot of fun. So anyway, all that to say, that was, again, talking a lot, but uh, invite somebody. Come yourself. Enjoy it. It'll be fun. It'll be an hour and a half of your life. And hopefully some person who is not, you know, into the church things will feel more comfortable in this setting. I'm going to stop now. Any other announcements before we close out today? Have, has anyone not offended? Anyone offended now or anyone not offended, I should say? I know I offend someone every single Sunday, I feel like. Anybody? More people today. I have offended more people today than I did. Carol, Carolyn counted, and she said more people are offended today than ever. So good. I, I did my job, but don't complain about it. There you go. Let's pray. I'm going to stop talking. Let's get out of here. Most Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this church family. Thank you for commissioning us as your people to go and be a light to the world. Uh, thank you for all the, uh, the ministries that you're stirring in the hearts of the people here by reminding us that church starts now. That's not all about Sunday morning. This is beautiful. This is wonderful. This is a pep rally for the rest of the week. But church actually starts when we leave this place and engaging with your people and, and answering the bell when you put a ministry on our hearts. So thank you so much for doing that. Thank you for the servants in this church. I've never seen servants in any church I've ever been in like this place here. This is amazing. So thank you so much for that. Even as you continue to uh, push us out of our comfort zones and, and remind us that that's where the growth is. For us in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. God bless you and have a great week. Thank you.